In this video, we will cover the next segment of data protection, which is backing up data. So why is backing up data important? Well, because many issues are bound to arise within your organization. Some of them may be due to human error. Actually, most of them will be due to human error. You have unexpected updates and patches that can actually destroy things and cause a lot of havoc, which we've seen with some companies. We have Mother Nature taking its course, causing earthquakes and fires and explosions, overheating, power outages, and then we have just general server room issues. You may be wondering why these percentages don't add up to 100. Well, that's because any of these could have happened at the same time. So it's important to have backup management policies in case any need arises to restore from backup. So some things that are important is what are you going to back up? What, how are you going to create this backup and where are you going to store it? Additionally, you need to have procedures in place, maybe even practice in place, for how you're going to restore from this backup in case you need to. You're going to also deem where it is necessary to store this data. So if you have your data backed up in the same region as your primary facility, let's say for example you have a facility in Louisiana and you have a facility in Mississippi and a hurricane comes through and wipes out both your facilities then you're just out of luck and indeed this did happen to some companies down in the south so make sure that you have your backup in a different location than your primary source we need to encrypt the data as we back up whether or not we're doing an off-site backup with a third party or whether we're doing our own backup we need to have a way to transfer this data and ensure that it is encrypted so that no one can retrieve the data if they are able to gain access to this resource. We need to maintain proper access control. So when I worked in a data center, we had to swipe our card to be able to gain access to the data center and only our team had access to this data center in order to ensure that all of our servers and information on these devices were protected. We need to have policies about how long we're going to retain our data, whether it's a week, a month, or a couple months. Now when you're under litigation, this may require you to store data for much longer than your original policies. So for example, when I worked in the data center, if we were under a lawsuit for certain things, we had to hold on to all the data that was associated with this lawsuit and anything that was on the same drives as this lawsuit for seven years. And then finally, we want to audit to make sure that our data is actually being backed up so that if something does happen, we can restore from backup instead of just having faulty backups. And just for my personal server, I created a backup and there were some issues that would happen that would prevent the backup from running. So I had to diagnose these issues and fix them so that the backup could run. But in the meantime, there were some students that made a mistake and lost their file. I went to restore it from the backup and it wasn't there because of the faulty backup. So just make sure that you're double checking and auditing these backups so that you can ensure that they are up and running. Another thing that is backed up by companies is email. So all email is retained. A word of advice to all of you, never put anything in a message that you would not want seen in court, printed in a newspaper, or read by your boss. So what do we back up? Determining what to back up and what not to back up is going to be dependent on the organization. But there are several ways of backing up. First, we can back up a specific file or directory. Think of like OneDrive and how that just uploading your certain files to OneDrive could back up that information. We could have a full image backup. So this isn't just files. This is all the software that is associated with that machine. So we get a complete image. We save that to a file. If something were to happen to the original device, we could then use that backup to then restore the device back to its original state as if nothing had happened. There's also shadowing, which means we have different versions of the copies that are saved over time. So if you ever use OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Docs, you can go back to the previous versions of these files and restore those files if you need to. Typically what happens with backups is that there's going to be a full backup that's initiated at every certain time interval, whether that's a week or a month or a few months. And then each day you're going to have an incremental backup. And this total backup is going to be the summation of your last full backup plus all the incremental backups. Typically what happens is that an organization, after a week or a month, they will generate another full backup and then they'll get rid of all the incremental backups and the previous full backup because they no longer need to retain that information. So how do we manage all the backup disks? Well, we have a centralized backup system. 
So we have a backup console that is connected to a server and it's going to be able to initiate commands to tell the server exactly what is going to be backed up. When I worked at a data center, we had one particular person who was in charge of ensuring that these backups were run every day and he would reconfigure it or pre-configure it if necessary to be able to back up certain things. This backup console is going to have software and hardware to ensure that it can properly back up everything it needs to. And it will back up other devices or other servers if necessary. So different types of backup media, some of these are becoming less used like optical discs. Magnetic tape was still used because it was easy and cheap and it just did a sequential backup. But we're moving more to multiple hard drives such as RAID arrays, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So one thing that an organization needs to determine is what is the acceptable data loss versus how fast do we want to be able to recover our data. Between past and future, we may have a disaster that occurs. And so the recovery point objective is the point at where if a disaster were to occur, we want to ensure that everything up to this point has been backed up. So this green arrow is indicating everything must be recoverable before this point and everything else is acceptable data loss. In the future, the recovery time objective is all about how fast must we get back to fully functional operations. And so anything between the disaster and this time is the downtime it would take for data recovery. And that's going to be de deemed by the organization as how much time is an acceptable amount of downtime. Then from the recovery time objective onward, that's going to be normal operation and everything has been recovered back to its normal state. A way that industries ensure that their data is constantly being backed up and that there is no loss is using RAID arrays. So let's talk about each of the different levels of the RAID array. First is no RAID at all. So essentially we have a server that's just going to be backed up to a disk. So what happens if this disk fails? All the data that's been backed up is going to be completely lost because there is no redundancy to ensure that this data is protected. So now we introduce RAID level 0. So what this introduces is the concept of striping, which we're going to take the bits of each one of our files and we're going to stripe them to different disks. So now we have nine parts that are distributed across each one of these disks. So each of those parts can then be reconstructed back into the original files. The problem here is what happens if one of these disks fail? Well, since the parts of these files are distributed across multiple disks, if one of these fails, the file will become corrupt because some of the parts are missing. Then we move to RAID level 1, which introduces the concept of mirroring. Mirroring means that we're going to duplicate certain parts across multiple disks. So as you can see, part 1 is duplicated across disk 1, 2, and 3. Same with part 2 and same with part 3. So if we lose disk 3, nothing will happen. We'll still have it duplicated across disk 1 and 2. We could even lose disk 2 as well, and we'd still have all the information on disk 1. But this can be costly to duplicate everything across multiple disks. So that brings us to the next RAID level, which is RAID level 5. Now RAID level 5 introduces the concept of the parity bit. What this is going to do is it's going to perform an XOR summation that is going to combine the bits across multiple disks and create what is called a parity bit. We'll talk about what XOR means in just a second. But essentially by adding parts 1 and 2, I get a parity 1 and 2. By adding parts 3 and 4, I get a parity of 3 and 4. And by adding 5 and 6, I get a parity of 5 and 6. So if disk 3 were to fail here, I could still reconstruct the missing disk by combining the two disks of 1 and 2 using those parity bits to reconstruct the parts that are missing. There is a RAID level 6 that introduces a fourth disk, and so that if we had two disks fail, we wouldn't lose all of our data. Because in RAID level 5, if two disks failed, we would lose all of our data. So how does this recovery work? So let's say disk 3 failed, how do we get back to what the data was originally? So what we're going to do is use XOR. We're going to add part 1 to part 2 to produce parity 1 and 2. We're going to add part 3 to parity 3 and 4 and this will produce part 4. And we'll add parity 5 and 6 to part 5 and this will produce part 6. So this is using what we call XOR parity bit computing. What this is going to do is if I have 0 and I combine it with a 0, it's going to be 0. So 0 plus 0 equals 0. Now if I do 0 plus 1, it's going to be 1. If I do 1 plus 0, it's going to be 1. 
and then if I do 1 plus 1, it's going to be 0. So think of a light switch. If I said flip that light switch twice, it's going to be in the off position. Since computers speak in binary, there's only two different possibilities, on or off. So by having it 1 twice, it is going to be in the off position. So looking at this table, if I have part one and part two with eight bits, I'm going to do XOR parity bit computing. I'm gonna take bit one and I'm gonna take zero plus one and that's gonna give me one. And then bit two is one plus one is gonna give me zero. Bit three is one plus zero is gonna give me one and so on down the line. So let's say that we had a disk failure. Having that parity bit and part one, how would we recover the data that is associated with part two? Well, we just go back and compute these again. So 0 plus 1 is 1, and then 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, and then you would get the exact same information of, as we had from above. So what I want you to do is compute the missing bits that exist in this table. So pause this video and then come back and check your answer. Welcome back. So let's go through this. So let's start with parts 1 and 2 and parity at bit 1 and 2. So I'm going to do 1 plus 0 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 0, 0 plus 1 equals 1, 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Then we go to the next piece, so 1 plus 1 equals 0, 1 plus 0 equals 1, 0 plus 0 equals 0, and then we have 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Then we go to the next parts, 5 and 6, and they're parity bit, so 0 plus 1 equals 1, so 1, and then 1 plus 1 is 0, 1 plus 0 equals 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And that's how we would compute the missing bits. There are additional levels of RAID, but they're more a combination of the techniques that we previously discussed. So for example, RAID 10 is going to combine RAID level 1 with RAID level 0. So what we have here are the different pieces that are being mirrored within RAID level 1, and then we're going to stripe those across to a different RAID level 1 that is also going to mirror those striped bits. We have RAID 50, which is going to combine RAID level 5 with RAID level 0. So we have the parity bit system combined with striping to produce multiple different backups there. And then we have RAID level 100, which is going to be RAID level 1 with RAID level 0 twice. So we start with the first of mirroring the bits across multiple drives, and then we're going to stripe those, and then we'll stripe them yet again, and each of these will have their own mirroring elements associated with them. So in summary, having no RAID is not a good option and if something were to fail, but it does have normal transfer speed. RAID level 0 does have very fast transfer speed, but again, it doesn't have any fault tolerance. If something fails, it will lose all the data. Mirroring is going to require two disks. It does have redundancy, and we will have a fault tolerance of n minus 1 drives, so we can have the total number of drives fail equivalent to everything except for one last drive. And then this is going to have normal transfer speeds. The benefit of having RAID level 5 and RAID level 6 is that it's going to be fast read, but it's going to be slower write to actually put those on the devices because we have to compute all the parity bits to be able to store across different disks. The only advantage that RAID level 6 has over RAID level 5 is an additional drive failure in case something were to happen. It does have the disadvantage that it would be slower to write because now we're dealing with four drives that we are distributing the bits across instead of three drives.